Okay, let's check in with the radio. Uh, wait, can you hear me? Greetings from the rock. It's not working with this here. Uh, well, the problem with that Bluetooth speaker, I'm going to shift it to, to shift the speaker. That Bluetooth speaker takes a while. You have to sort of talk and then it. Wait, or can you hear us? I can hear you guys. I don't know if you can hear me. Yep, we can. <clears throat> can't hear Mark. He can't hear you very well. Maybe that needs to turn up. Sorry. If you can't, you won't even let me control. Try now. Good morning. Okay. All right. Wait, can you hear me? We're hearing Mark through the computer, not the microphone. Okay, try now. Wait. Yay. It's Mark, over. Okay. <laughs> All right. Previously on the uh, David versus Saul saga, um, <clears throat> Saul pursued the fugitive David and his band of 600 men all over Judah. Twice David had opportunities to kill Saul, but David would not do it because Saul was the Lord's anointed one. In their last encounter, Saul gave his blessing to David's eventual ascendancy to the front throne. David then retreated to Ziklag in Philistine territory when he signed himself and his band into the service of the king of Goth. Now moving on to 1 Samuel chapter 28. Saul wants to speak to the ghost of Samuel. So he addresses a medium. <laughs> yes. That's right. <laughs> Years ago, at Samuel's insistence that the people of Israel would be a holy nation, Saul had expelled all people who claimed to have ungodly powers, like the power to speak of the spirits of the dead. <laughs> that was a technical sound. <laughs> now Samuel, that old prophet who anointed both Saul and David, had died and was buried in Ramal. This tower is supposed to mark the burial spot. Once again, Saul gathered all of Israel to fight the Philistines who had assembled at Shunem. When Saul saw the size of the enemy from the top of Mount Gilboa, he trembled. And what we have on the map here is the uh, army under Saul and the uh, Philistine army, red and green. In a prayer, Saul asked the Lord for help, but the Lord did not answer him. Hmm. Obvious reasons. So Saul did something he should have not done. He asked his servants to find a medium, one who would call on Samuel for advice, even though Samuel was dead. The servants inquired and found a medium in Endor. The word for medium is sometimes translated to witch. Saul went to this person, a woman in disguise, said, please consult a spirit for me. So, so if this is a medium, what good is the disguise? Huh? <laughs> uh, no, it was uh, Samuel. Samuel was in no, Saul right? was in disguise. Saul was in disguise. Okay. Oh, yes, that's right. Well, or she could see the dead, but he was alive. So therefore, <laughs> I don't know, I'm making this up as I go along. <laughs> By the way, I'm not marrying in case you haven't noticed it. <laughs> uh, the woman said, surely, you know that Saul has forbidden this very thing. Why are you trying to have me break the, his law? I could lose my life for this. Saul promised her, as the Lord lives, no punishment shall come to you for this. Because I'm actually Saul. So. 
In other words, he was promising that he wouldn't tell Saul. Then the woman said, whom shall I call up for you? Saul said, Samuel. The woman did call for Samuel's ghost to come. And the minute Samuel appeared, the woman realized that only Saul who would ask to speak to Samuel. She was a little slow in the uptake. <laughs> the medium said, why did you deceive me with your disguise? Have no fear of me. What do you see? She described Samuel. Saul bowed to Samuel's spirit by putting his face to the ground. Samuel asked Saul, why have you disturbed me from being, bringing me back to this world? Yes, the multiverse. I am in great distress, Saul responded. A huge army of Philistines have gathered for war and God has turned away and answers me no more. So I summon you to tell me what to do. Samuel answered, the Lord has done to you just what I told you the Lord would do. He is tearing your kingdom from your grasp and giving it to David. The Philistines will win tomorrow and you and your sons will join me in death. Samuel then disappeared. Saul's knees buckled partly because he was terrified and partly because he had not eaten for 24 hours. <laughs> and I'm hungry, by the way. The medium said, I have risked my life for you. Now listen to me. Eat the food I will prepare for you. Eat. She apparently has really a soft heart. Is God being kind to Saul through her? Mm. Don't give it away. Saul refused, but his servants urged him. So he ate his last meal of meat and bread, which she prepared. Last meal being he's about to go into battle. So why would he refuse to eat? Is that just being obstinate? Yeah. Well, he's also traveling across the desert. So, you know, bivouacking and there just might have been limited I mean, he resources. Sorry, consulting media called uh, Samuel up from the dead. What else can you do wrong? I mean, yes. <laughs> yeah, this is Old Testament. Yeah. <laughs> Strange stories. <laughs> then Saul left her house and returned to camp, ready to fight and die the next day. <laughs> when David prays, he apparently feels God is with him. And in whatever way, David feels God's approval or disapproval of his plan for action. When Saul prays, nothing happens. Samuel claims God has abandoned Saul. Have you ever felt God abandon you? Did God actually depart from you? Has God ever stopped trying to communicate with people like Saul? So maybe Saul's just choosing not to hear what God's saying as in no. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or how has Saul's behavior, being an anointed one, confirmed his faith in the Lord? Maybe not so much. When you look at the evil things he's done, he's chasing David around, trying to kill him. Right. <clears throat> As an Israelite, whether or not you were a David supporter, what does this story say about the quality of Saul, the man chosen as king? I think he was smoking some peyote. <laughs> <laughs> peyote? <laughs> yeah, even back then it was legal in Colorado, right? <laughs> but they found traces of it in ancient bones. Huh? Is that right? Yes. Huh. During the biblical times. That's amazing that they could trace that. <clears throat> DNA does not lie. 
So says the FBI. <laughs> if you were an Israelite who preferred a confederation of tribes over a monarchy, what would this story tell you about the kings in general? So two forms of government, right? Mm -hmm. Monarch-led um, nation versus a confederation. Yeah. Confederation gives power more to tribal leaders. Monarchy, well, not in the case of British monarchy, but monarchy generally consolidates power. Yeah, if you think of our American experience, yeah. we have the Confederate states that mm -hmm. come up to be part of the Union. Right. You know, so there is this uh, issue that obviously goes back millennia about states' rights. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then today we could put it in the context of uh, autocracies, right? When you look at the autocracies that are in the news these days, North Korea, um, China, Russia, you know, they all share this. There's a very vertical chain of command or power structure. And the guy on top, you know, has to kill off his uncle in order to show that he's strong in the case of North Korea. So that's another difference between a federation, I mean, a confederation and a monarchy. Mark, uh, you skipped over the question about uh, what does the story say about the quality of Saul, the man chosen as king? Oh, um, yes. I don't know in, in the Old Testament writings if... God was all omnipotent, and uh, when he chose Saul, he must have known that Saul was going to turn away. Um, so it's a little curious to me why Saul was chosen in the first place to be king if he was God's anointed, or if that's just part of the story in the Old Testament that Saul eventually <laughs> turned away from God and lost favor with God? That's a really interesting question. But, yeah. um, it, it raises, I mean, you'd have to, you'd have to, to, to go back and, and sort of get a picture of that. You sort of have to know what the theology was that, that was held by the people who were writing, were writing these stories. Did they believe? in an omnipotent God at the time that they were writing the story. Well, and our mission. And our mission, yeah. Then it was, it was that part of their theology at this point when they were writing the story? Or is that something that we're reading back into? I don't know the answer to that. Um, well, does that take away Saul's free will? I mean, free will takes into this. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, free will and omniscience is, is the big point of debate. But I think your, your question is really good. You know, he chose he chose Saul, and then oops, <laughs> can God say oops? Um, is basically what you're asking. Yeah, this reminds me of in Bible 101 when we did Genesis. Some of you were there. We had a long conversation about the tree of knowledge and the um, apparent um, conflict between omniscient God and willpower. And I think what we settled on was God knew what was going to happen, but it was the tree of knowledge that gave man willpower. In other words, the right to see what's right and wrong and then to constantly make those decisions. The birth of, of sin. Um, Mary has a, another interesting question here. Wasn't it Nancy Reagan who routinely consulted uh, astrologist? What's your opinion about that? And what role did jelly beans play? <laughs> the jelly beans. <laughs> well, given uh, Reagan's uh, mental status the last year of his presidency, she was pretty much the president in absentia. Kind of scary. Yeah, it was Baker who was Secretary of State or Chief of Staff. Mm -hmm. And there was a big in house fight between Reagan and I mean, Nancy Reagan and, and Baker about this issue. 
<laughs> he wasn't he wasn't on board. <laughs> she, she had the same power that he has, and she was just the wife. She wasn't a, yeah. an appointed official. Well, I, that's, that's the scary part. You know, in the daily office I share right now, um, the, the reading from the Hebrew scriptures is Leviticus. And um, I love Leviticus, it just felt so much fun. But early in the week uh, was the, the prohibition to consult a meeting. You shall not go to soothsayers or, or any of those kinds of folks. But reading it in the context of everything else, what occurred to me is that all of the things that were being prohibited were being prohibited because if you did them, you challenged the authority of God. Or you did not bow to the authority of God. If you challenge, if you go to a, to a medium, you're saying, well, I'm not going to listen to what God's having to say. Um, or if you get a tattoo, if you're marking yourself with something other than what God would want you to be marked with. You know, so unless, unless the United States is a theocracy and we're going to live by the laws of the Vegas, Nancy Reagan can consult with this problem just all she wants. <laughs> you, know, you know, where's the authority coming from? But, you know, I, I just find it laughable to be personally, you know, to throw that in. I don't think it has much, I think it has more to do with people who think that this is a theocracy and have to try and figure out how to uh, uh, justify what, what she was doing with the yeah. view of mm -hmm. America as a Christian nation. <laughs> Right, right. And well, and, and sometimes it's a little confusing because it does appear that we're a theocracy, you know, and in God we trust is on our currency and things like that. And how we started off with the main church being the Episcopal Church in, in America. But uh, yeah, we're primarily secular. Um, the final question that she has is, why do you suppose this story was included in the book of Samuel? Are you talking about just the story of the medium? Medium? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> well, I think it's interesting that the medium basically affirmed, you know, to piggyback on what Gary was saying, affirmed what God had said. Mm -hmm. You know, or she could have said, you idiot, God already told you this. You know, basically she did it. Like, why are you wasting my time? God's already told you. You're you're losing, you're going to die, you up. Mm -hmm. and, and he was, mm -hmm. I think, hoping to hear a different message. And what you're saying kind of loops back to an earlier question was, um, why did God ignore Samuel? I mean, uh, sorry, Saul. Yeah, uh, God ignored him. Yeah. And he said no. And, right. And Saul was, ah, yes. <laughs> Good. You know, it's like when you go to 17 different doctors hoping to hear a different thing. <laughs> you know, like you got to 17 doctors and they told you to lose weight and start exercising. Maybe the 18 has a pair. You know? Especially if he's a smoker and he's overweight. That's yeah. the one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's called confirmation bias, right? The psychiatry. Um, anyway, so we have uh, the end of this set of slides. Gary, if we could next, next go to the next one. Your folks. All right, so you put in the slides. You go to window. Education is one way. Three, there's two. Okay, so that isn't so far. Well, let me just. <laughs> Didn't have this one at the beginning. There we go. Then I hit play, I presume. Okay, good. Uh, so, yes. <laughs> Act two, David saves the people of Ziklag. He does not save the town, though. The day came when David was called to fight on the Palestine side of the battle with Israel. In fact, he and his men were called to fight as bodyguards to the king of God, who would have been in the heart of the battle. Now, when David arrived at the battle under King Ash Akish. Akish, thank you, Ashkish's command, the other 
Philistine kings and generals shouted. What is that Israelite doing here? My God, he's just little Lego people. <laughs> what kind of bodyguard is that? Read directly from the script. <laughs> yes. King Akish of Goth replied, this is David, not the servant of King Saul, but my men since deserting his country over a year ago. I have no doubt of his loyalty to me. The other kings and generals were not convinced. They said, he shall not go into battle with us. Send him back. Another said, isn't he the one in the song that goes, Saul kill his thousands and David his tens thousands? So King Akish called David to him saying, I have found no fault with you, but the other generals and kings cannot fight with you at their side. Therefore, I order you to go back to Ziklag. Go with my blessing. David left early the next morning and traveled for three days to get home. When they arrived at Ziklag, they saw that the town had been attacked and then burned to the ground. All the women and children were missing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this was a bit of a stretch, <laughs> image-wise. All the women and children were missing, including Abigail and Ahinomen. Ahinomen, thank you. David's wives. They had apparently been taken captive. Some of David's men were so angry they talked of stoning David. Hmm. Bit of a revolt. However, David ignored them and prayed for God's help. Then he asked Abithathar, Abithar, thank you, for the ephod. David asked God, Shall I pursue the band who burned our village? God said, yes. If you pursue, you shall rescue your people. <clears throat> so David followed the tracks until they came to a wadi, which is like our royal, it's a dry creek bit, named Besar. Now the older men had been jogging for five days straight. <laughs> They were too exhausted to go any further. So there, 200 men stayed behind. It was a fundraiser. <laughs> In the open rocky country, they found an Egyptian nearly dead and carried him to David. David ordered for food and drink to be given to the man. He revived after he had eaten and slept. David then questioned him. The young man said, I am Egyptian and a slave to the Amalekite master. He left me here three days ago because I was too sick to keep up. I was there when the Amalekites raided Cherith and Judah and burned Ziklag. I witnessed. David said, we are having trouble tracking them on these rocks. Do you know where they will camp? And will you take us to them? The Egyptian answered, I will if you promise not to kill me and not to return me to my master. So David promised such. David continued to jog toward the camp. I don't know if the King James Version has jogging. <laughs> well, they didn't walk slowly. It's okay. like the they strode and they arrived around noon. David's scouts said that they saw their enemy sprawled across the grounds on the other side of the nearby hill. They were getting too full of food and drink to fight. David let his men rest for until twilight. 
Then they attacked. Few Amalekites escaped with their lives. All the women and children and all of their stolen things were recovered. Yay. Yes, victorious. David also found things that belonged to the Cherith in Judah. And he discovered herds of cattle and flock whose true owners were unknown. <clears throat> when David brought all these people and flocks back to Wadi Basar, the men who had been with David said that they should not share the flocks with the 200 that did not come. They're the ones that were too tired to do the joke. David commanded, and he said, no, God gave us victory. So all who belong to God deserve a share of what we have gained. This ruling became a lawful practice used in Israel long after David. When David got back to Ziklag, he sent men to Cherith in Judah and the items recovered from the Amalekites that belonged to them. The background now. Malachites have long a history of attacking Israelites. They were the tribe that attacked Moses' people in the desert in Exodus, and against whom Joshua developed a strategy for their defeat. They were allies in the army Gideon defeated. They continued to raid until God gave Saul to order to kill every one of them. When Saul did not obey that order, Saul lost God's favor forever. Another example of a violent God in Old Testament. The last place Amalekite shows up in the Bible is the book of Esther, the prime minister who tricked his king into signing a decree that ordered a genocide of all Jews in Persia was Amalekite. Esther foiled that plot. You may have noticed that there is no attempt to take prisoners. David lived in a brutal world where the code of honor did not extend to enemy nations. So in many behaviors, David is exactly like Saul. What do you think distinguishes him from Saul so far? How is David distinguished from Saul so far in the story? <laughs> and that's important. <laughs> Does he listen to God or does he ignore God like Saul did? Does he have two beautiful wives like David does? <laughs> Saul was no, no, he was probably old curmudgeonly. Okay, on to Act so, so Three. We kind oh. of skipped over what happened to Saul and his. Uh, people. Is that recorded someplace else? We knew they were going into battle. Yeah. So the question is, are we still going to get to the battle halls? Oh, yes, yes, that comes in. This is an interlude. <laughs> and actually, the Samuel's written that way, where yeah. it starts off with the story, and then it breaks off and provides this backstory, like a novel would. And then now in Act 3, which we get to next, uh, we'll see what happens with Saul. A good question, but you're right. There you go. The death of Saul. How David mourns. Now this is in 2 Samuel chapter 1. You might be wondering why there are two Samuels. Now the Philistines fought against Israel. Israel's army fled before the Philistines. The Philistines overtook Saul's sons. They killed Jonathan, which broke my heart. Amidadab. Amidadab, thank you. And Micah Shushua. Micah Shushua. <laughs> <laughs> Gary's my Google translator today. <laughs> yes. When Saul was badly wounded by archers, he asked his he asked his armor bearer to kill him so that the Philistines would not capture him alive. Now, this is an important point. Remember this because we're going to come back to it in Act 4. 
The armor bearer would not raise his hand against God's anointed one. In the end, Saul fell on his own sword. Suicide. Yeah, he took his own life. When the people of Israel saw his retreat and the oncoming Philistines, they abandoned their towns and farms and fled beyond the Jordan River. The Philistines moved into the empty houses. When the Philistines came upon Saul's body, they stripped his armor and gave it as an offering to their goddess, a star. And I'm trying to remember who she was the goddess of. I forget the mythology. Might come to me. Then the Philistine, Philistines took Saul's body, the body of Jonathan and his two brothers, hung them on the outside of the city walls of Bethshan. Nice. Yes. This is a brutal time where you had to show that you defeated your opponent, your adversary. When the people of Jabesh Gilead heard this, some of their valiant men traveled through the night to recover their bodies. This was their way of paying Saul back for saving their city when he was first king. These men washed and wrapped the bodies, prayed over them and fasted. They buried them under a tamarisk tree in Jabish and mourned officially for seven days. Now, Second Samuel. Why is there a second Samuel? Two scrolls for one story. See, the story of Samuel, David, and Saul are subjects of the first scroll of Samuel. The second scroll concentrates on David's reign as king. However, it's really the same story. It's one novel. No, I should say no. It's one story. Not part one, part two, so why two scrolls? One scroll could only hold the information that 30 pages of our printed books could hold. David's story was twice that long. Scrolls any bigger than 30 pages were too heavy and awkward to handle. So they broke it up. It seems like it was a nice dividing line there. Now into the second scroll. David mourns Saul and Jonathan. And he kills the messenger. We all know that phrase. David, who returned from fighting the Amalekites and was in Ziklag, only two days when a man claiming to be from Saul's camp came running into David's camp. The man wore torn clothes and had thrown dirt on his face as a sign that he was mourning. He fell to the ground before David as his way of showing David respect. David asks, where have you come from? I escaped the slaughter of the army of Israel. The army fled the battle, but also many fell and died fighting. Saul and Jonathan are dead. And David said, how do you know this? The man said, Saul, wounded and leaning on his sword, asked me to kill him. Oh, see, I told you to remember that. He said he was already dying from his wounds. I did kill him. Hmm. Looking for an alibi, maybe. Then I took the crown and his armlet and brought them to you. Where did you come from? Asked David. I am a Malachite, a resident alien in Saul's army. Were you not afraid to lift your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed one, Saul? Asked David. Then David said, his own mouth convicted him. He said, I have killed the Lord's anointed. David ordered that his messenger be killed. This messenger be killed. 
Does that seem harsh? It is our standards, but not by the standards in David's time. So do you think it's harsh? They killed the messenger. Yes. Are you suspicious of the messenger? Well, yeah, because he lied. Right. So is he really a spy? Or curry favor, yes. That's actually the truth. Now, you and I know Saul actually died, and it wasn't at the hand of Amalekite. However, David does not know that. The man says he killed Saul. David does know that the man took the crown and armlet off of Saul's body to bring him to David. The man probably assumed David was greedy for power and hated Saul. The man probably hoped to gain favor and a cash reward for this a new and greedy king. Because this messenger was not a good man, he would never guess that David was actually very respectful of Saul and his right to rule. However, such a messenger would betray any king if he could gain wealth from that betrayal. Therefore, he would be dangerous, and man, he would be a dangerous man to keep around. Here is what David may have been thinking though. The Bible does not say this, then, however. By the time Saul died, the only people free to roam the battlefield were those who fought with the Philistines. So David guessed that the man was an enemy to Saul and not a member of Saul's army, as he had previously claimed. Being an enemy of Israel is not a good reason to have him die. This man did not respect Saul's body, he robbed it. That would be punishable by death by itself. This man says he killed Saul. <clears throat> that is also a capital offense. David may sense the Amalekite messenger is lying, but he cannot just know how much, how much of a lie it is. David can and does believe that Saul is dead because Saul would never otherwise have surrendered his crown. David tore his own clothes. He wept and fasted until evening for Saul, for Jonathan, for Israel, and for the army of Israel. At evening, David sang the song of lamentation, sorrow, which he composed. Here are the portions of the song. Forgive me if I don't sing it. <laughs> Your glory, O Israel, lies slain upon the high places. How the mighty have fallen. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, nor the sword of Saul return empty. Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely, in life and in death, they are not divided. O daughters of Israel, weep for Saul. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of battle. Jonathan lies slain upon your high places. I am distressed for you. My brother Jonathan, greatly beloved, were you to me. How the mighty have fallen. And the weapons of war perished. So I love how there's so many phrases in these two books that are in sort of modern vernacular, right? Kill the messenger, oh, how the mighty have fallen. I mean, you could probably think of some other phrases that come to mind, that come, have a biblical origin. Yes. So Mary didn't have any questions after this, um, but I wanna ask, uh, what do you think of this song? Is it a tribute or is it a lamentation? And what do we do when we're mourning those who have passed? What's the tradition here? Yeah. 
<laughs> see, see the, see the what, the song? Yeah, but all together. Oh, all together. Yeah, I'll reference it for you. It's in Second Samuel. Um, at the end of chapter one. It's the last part of chapter one. Second Samuel one. Second Samuel one. Um, David's lament for Saul and Jonathan. Sounds more like a lamentation because uh, this is the Old Testament. So it's unclear to me if they believed in the afterlife. And so when we, when someone passes now as Christians, we uh, celebrate their life with us and their resurrection to be with Christ and God. So I'm not sure, going back to your question, it sounds more like a, a, a lamentation uh, to me in that, that's the end. Mm. Except you can go to a medium. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So they, you know, at first I thought they didn't believe in an afterlife, but they have this witch who's a medium and Saul goes there and she speaks to Samuel and Samuel comes back and speaks to Saul. So there was an afterlife, but did they give God agency in order to invoke that afterlife? In other words, I don't know the question of that. I'm not a well, think, historian, but. I, I'd have to go back and do a little bit more work on this. But, uh, I think the view of the afterlife was that it was kind of the land of the shades. Everybody just sort of went there. Um, there was, uh, before the Babylonian captivity, there was some sort of concept of heaven and hell in Jewish thinking. And um, so there was just this, this sort of land of, of the shades. So you summon people back, and it wasn't like they were partying or they were being tormented. It was just they were there. Mm -hmm. So, but I wonder too, the, the sort of scholar slash skeptic in me, um, wonders whether or not this is put in in David's mouth to show his fidelity to God and God's anointing and all those kinds of things, even with all the rest of this. Despite all of this, I'm composing this song, you know, and to show that I'm faithful and wanted, didn't want any of the rest of this to happen and all that. You know, so mm -hmm. did David write it? No. I have a question that's been just came to me. You know, we we listen to this story and we, we get all about parts you know, they're a little silly. Strange. But would Jewish people do that? I mean, when they read this scripture, do they look at it? Well, well that's ridiculous. And, or or is it I mean, I don't know that we would people like this over New Testament stuff to the same extent we do this. And if that's what like Mary translated it, I think. Yeah. Well, yeah, she's providing the narrative, but when you read the scripture, it's, you know, it's there. But these events. Are we, I don't know what the question is exactly, do we uh, revere the New Testament stories more solemnly than we do the Old Testament stories? Or, uh, you know, I mean, uh, would, would a Jewish person sitting over there think he would be made to the sacrilegious church? And I know that's pretty Jewish, but in an Indian box, there are not yet that. I don't know, my friend. <laughs> and um, I, I was talking to him about some, something similar to this. And, and he said, You know, we really only focus on the first five books. We don't read all the rest of this stuff. Uh, but he says, You know, when you're reading the stories about all of the stuff that's going on in Genesis, he says, It's all about dysfunctional family. <laughs> You know, so they don't think I'm right with the They don't have any problem. You know, the rabbis argue about all of this stuff for a long time. Why is all this stuff in there and all these kinds of things? So I don't know, you know, what both the stuff and what they would have been saying about these stories. But to your point, you know, do we revere the New Testament? There's the there's great story in the book of Acts about the, the Council of Acts where they're trying to figure out uh, what they should require of Gentiles to become Christians. And the conclusion that they come up with in the statement is, it has pleased the Holy Spirit and us 
that this is what we should require. <laughs> you know, oh, I'm glad it pleased you too. Oh, or was it really it pleased us to make this decision? We'll just say it. Yeah. So I mean, there's funny stuff in there. But if, if, if you can get past reading everything through the lens of piety, you know, um, you know and, and I, I meant several weeks ago, I made the comment um, that there's so much that's translated that we clean up because our sensibilities are, are not as earthy as those folks were uh, that we cleaned up. So I, I think, you know, we do go in with a certain set of lenses that makes it, um, yeah, uh, the, the, the lenses of piety, yeah. And the, isn't it true that the Old Testament stories, as they originate, not in the written word, but in the spoken word, date back thousands of years before Christ? So I think 3000 BC, some. some. So without um, scrolls or a way to record the stories, it had to be an oral history. And as an oral history, it has a different narrative. You know, you kind of have to spice it up. It's like sitting around a campfire and telling, sharing stories like that. And then they get in, in, embellished. embellished, thank you, <laughs> from one generation to the next, yeah. And like what you were saying, Father Gary, is that finally when it's codified as written, but well, then you really can't change it at that point because it's written. So now they they vet it a little bit. They take out maybe some of the stuff and go, well, maybe we shouldn't include that. Uh, but going back to your question, I think it's all in the context too, because we're, we're postmodern, right? So we have the Renaissance, the age of knowledge and reason and science, and so some of this stuff does seem a little incongruent with sort of this, what we learn in the secular world. Uh, but back then they didn't have the benefit of any of that. So there was probably a lot more mysticism. W would that be fair to say that there? Yes. There's a lot of mystery in yeah. the workings of nature. Uh, so they were more open to stories like this without questioning it. Okay. And maybe David, as, as Witt's suggesting, maybe David wrote the song as a lamentation, because a lot of people do that. They either write well in a journal or uh, authors might write a memoir, or just some way to capture somebody's life who's passed. That's what I was going to say. It's sort yeah. of reading the thing, sounds a little bit like a bad. Yeah, yeah, and it's somewhat cathartic. I, I could just say from personal experience, when my daughter passed on her first anniversary, I wrote an essay and it was helpful to put things in perspective of what happened over the year to me and to my memories of her. And uh, so maybe it was a lamentation. Yeah. Uh, next week, we will not have Fake Forum, right? It's Memorial Day. Um, so we'll come back to Bio 101, but it will be in a cycle. We'll probably do something different. Um, I don't know. I just have uh, one little anecdote to tell, and that is uh, uh, many of you knew Wilma Woodworth, years ago, uh, organist and choir director years ago at Good Shepherd. And, uh, she had a very wry sense of humor. And um, she said that, uh, you know, we don't, I mentioned we don't have any real knowledge in the Old Testament what the Jews were thinking about the afterlife, but in the New Testament, two different sects, uh, and there may have been more, but the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Pharisees believed in something beyond this life, and uh, the Sadducees did not. And the way you can remember that is the Pharisees uh, believed in the afterlife, and therefore the, Sadju the, they were, the Sadducees were sad, you see. <laughs> it's a good mnemonic device. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and, and remember when well we weren't around then but you remember of hearing that seances were very popular in the turn of the 20th century mm -hmm. yeah arthur uh, conan doyle you know who wrote the sherlock holmes series he was well into this and he was secular he was, he so you know i think it's a lot of people of different viewpoints had this knowledge of a land of shadows that they're Great beyond doesn't end with the demise. Something else is happening. The Ouija boards were big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the sixties, yeah, my mother really liked it. <laughs> <laughs>